Hi, I am Dr. Shinjini and today we will be going through a discussion on a case of severe endometriosis for conservative management. As we all know, performing a conservative surgery is sometimes more challenging in endometriosis than performing a TLH BSO. So this is a 32 year old lady, para 1 living one with the previous caesarean section 4 years back. She had history of a previous laparoscopic left sided chocolate cyst drainage and probably incomplete surgery which she underwent 2 years ago and after that she had progressively increasing dysmenorrhea on a scale of 8 on 10 and severe dyspareunia. There are bilateral endometriotic TO masses and deep endometriotic nodules on the uterosacral and the parametrial regions as we will see further. So this is the first view on laparoscopy and we are taking the ports in. So two ipsilateral ports on the left side and a similar configuration on the right side. On first view we see some momentoparietal adhesions. These are probably due to the past c-section or even due to the past laparoscopic surgery. So releasing them, taking the omentum away and this is the first view of the pelvic region. Once the omental screen is removed, we take the contralateral ports or the assistant side ports. The surgery starts with the first release of the sigmoidal adhesions onto the left sided adnexal mass. As you can see, the pelvis can hardly be seen because it is completely obliterated. The uterus is very very non-liftable and difficult to antivert with the manipulator and there is complete medialization of the pelvic structures. So the first rule in any endometriosis surgery is to start from the left hand side and to release the sigmoid congenital adhesions that is the white line of tolls and the best way to do this is to preserve the white line and move the sigmoid more medially. So giving medial traction on the sigmoid and releasing the white line of tolls there and thereby releasing the congenital adhesions. Now a trick here so as to cause easy exposure of the left pararectal space is to take this sigmoid congenital attachment as high as possible and a good way to know that the sigmoid has been mobilized adequately is the fact that the left psoas muscle should now become visible. So you have to keep doing this mobilization of the sigmoid till you feel that the axis of the sigmoid has got corrected and also another good sign is to know that the left psoas muscle is now easily available. Once the left psoas muscle is seen well, we know that the sigmoid is adequately released and this will gain us entry into the left medial pararectal space. As you can see now, the line of the hormonic is moving towards the left medial pararectal space following the white line again and making gentle tractional movements, we move into this avascular space. The fat of the sigmoid is again traced and then we open this space a little bit further. Now the very next step that we do here is to open the pelvic triangle a little bit on the superior aspect so as to be able to locate the infundibulopelvic ligament. In such cases where there is complete medialization of the pelvic structures, the ureter, the IP ligaments on both sides as well as the rectum, everything is tented towards the central midline. So before starting any surgery, it is vital to locate the ureter 
and this we start doing after the medial pararectal space is gained entry on the left side and now the next step would be to locate the left ureter which is now under vision. So the structure which is held by the left hand grasper will be the infundibulopelvic ligament just above or superior to the ureter at the level of the promontory. You can already see the ureter coming nicely into view now. This is being tugged by my grasper gently and once the ureter is under view, we proceed medial to the ureter and continue to develop the medial pararectal space. A few releasing incisions are given flush to the infundibulopelvic ligament also so as to be able to caudally mobilize the ureter more easily. The harmonic scalpel is a beautiful device with minimal lateral spread and great dissecting ability in such cases. You can see the line of cut, the surgeon's left hand is tracting the IP ligament and the ureter is generally mobilized caudally and with each step small bites of the harmonic are used to cause further release of the structures. Once the ureter is primarily mobilized on the left side, then we release the bowel now and you can see these are flimsy adhesions of the small bowel which have reached to the central midline of the pelvis. You can identify the mesentery of the small bowel there and with gentle movements we are releasing this. You can see the small bowel loop there lying down which is being pulled in, tugged in towards the central midline. Again repeatedly this is a medializing disease and you can even see the ileal loop having dragged itself towards the central midline blocking the pouch of Douglas completely. In order to make some space and as was shown by the USG there is a, a, a clear collection on the right adnexa which we now drain so that the bulkiness of the right adnexa is slightly reduced. Once this is done, the adnexa becomes more stretchable, more holdable. So you can see that we now move on the right hemipelvis and we release the bowel adhesions on the right hemipelvis from the right sided cyst. So as I am stretching on the right ovarian cyst, there is an invert inadvertent drainage of the content of the right sided chocolate cyst. A suction is being introduced to promptly suck out the contents because our primary goal is to avoid staining of the retroperitoneal structures as far as possible. So if an inadvertent nick is made into the cyst, it would be wise to enter with the suction there and let the chocolate fluid be sucked out as rapidly as possible without allowing it to spill into the space below. At this point, a little bit of vasopressin. So the dilution we have used is 20 international units diluted to 300 ml of normal saline and we are injecting a very small amount in the central midline of the uterus so as to cause a little bit of devascularization at that level. The bowel is very snugly adherent and a cold scissor adhesiolysis is attempted at this stage to release the bowel. Notice the gentle movement of the scissor, the cutting as well as the traction which is applied by the scissor which gently persuades the bowel on the lower side. You can see as the right plane is reached, the bowel drops down and so with good traction on the cyst side using the scissor guardedly cutting wherever required but then at the same time pushing with the noose of the scissor and creating the adhesiolysis here.
Small and gentle movements are the key to success in any bowel adhesiolysis. As far as possible, we try to minimize bleeding because bleeding lessens the light exposure in lap laparoscopy, it soils the retroperitoneal planes and so as far as possible, bleeding should be avoided. This is easy to say than to achieve as we all know that neovascularization is a part of endometriotic pathology and so it makes the surgery look a little more bloody and messy. So that's the small bowel loop which was released and once this central bit of adhesiolysis is over, we turn attention towards the bladder. Remembering this is a case of a previous C-section, you can see the doubling up of the bladder onto the anterior aspect there and now releasing the bladder fold there. The line of incision is extended towards the right round ligament, shifting attention onto the left side there. Again noticing the level of the round ligament and lifting the peritoneum from the anterior border of the round ligament and then equating the edges from the central part. So the bladder is held by my left hand and this is the release of the doubled up bladder. Once this basic adhesiolysis is achieved, there is some normalization of the anatomy that we now perceive. So that was just the doubled up bladder and now the actual bladder is being released. So we leave this at this stage because for a conservative surgery we don't have to go to the anterior compartment which looks quite uninvolved and we now proceed our attention towards the adnexae. So coming to the left adnexae now, you can see now the adnexal release goes synonymously with the release of the ureter. At each stage the ureter has to be observed, it has to be dropped caudally and then step by step the adnexae is lifted till we have its two attachments that is the ovarian li uh, ligament and the IP ligament in our vision. So releasing the tissues there, pushing the ureter at each step and moving forward and medially towards the utero-ovarian ligament. The adnexa is gently lifted from the floor where it was attached and finally the left side anatomy is normalized here. You can now see that we have nearly achieved good functional anatomy on the left adnexal side. Again keeping the ureter into view at all points of time is vital and is extremely important. At each step, the ureter is dropped caudally and then once it is under vision, small amount of harmonic is used to release the left adnexa. You can already see the left adnexa is tented by my left hand and now it is completely relatively free, held only by its two natural attachments. So this is the fibrosis at the level of the utero ovarian, shifting back attention to the round ligament tubal junction, some adhesions here are again opened up and you get the natural cleavage plane between the tubal structure and the round ligament. Continuing with the left adnexal release and following the anatomy again, releasing the round ligament completely now and trying to delineate the left sided tube. So now the left side tube can be seen released at its proximal end and now the tubo ovarian adhesions are being released. 
So we are trying to re-establish the anatomy of the left tubo-ovarian endometriotic mass. Since this is a conservative surgery, she is young, wishes to retain fertility as far as possible. We are trying to conserve at least the left side and we will take a call on the right side after this. So that's the fimbrial end of the tube coming up. The tube looks fairly released. That's the ovaria fimbrica there on the lower side. And these are the last part or the fimbrial or ampullary fimbrial end of the fallopian tube which are being released from the left ovary. After this we will proceed with the excision of the chocolate cyst wall on the left ovary once this anatomy is normalized. So starting the release or excision of the chocolate cyst wall. So I sometimes like to cut with a cold scissor somewhere near the central part of the cyst because this helps me split the cyst or large cysts into two halves and helps me delineate the planes better. So you can see how clearly the cyst wall can be identified from the normal ovarian tissue. If you will notice the instruments that I am using, these are instruments which can hold firmly and yet provide good traction. The grasper which is on my left hand is the pin grasper and this is a very very good instrument which helps to peel out the cyst walls very well. You can easily identify the beautiful plane of cleavage that we are trying to follow and trying to keep all the good ovarian tissue onto the patient side. The nose of the scissor here Again, I find particularly helpful in dissection. The movements should be very, very precise, small in caliber and very uh, traumatic. So, we will split the cyst wall into two fragments and then take each one by one. Notice the base of the ovary now, healthy red tissue seen and the excision of the cyst wall is now near complete. Since this is a fairly large cyst and the ovary is almost bivalved, I would suture the ovary with two ovicral so as to make the edges of the ovary rounded. Noticing a small remnant part of the wall on the under surface there and again peeling it out using scissors and gentle traction and counter traction forces keeping in mind to preserve the red healthy ovarian tissue. Finally using the harmonic to excise the DIE component or the deep endometriotic component which often runs on the base of the ovary and follows the vascular supply that is surrounding the infundibulo pelvic ligament or the ovarian ligament. So once this was released as I said previously the ovary is reunited back into its anatomical position. 
using 2 ovicral here to unite the ovarian edges. Once this is done, I will also internally hitch the ovary to the left lateral pelvic wall so as to take it out of the pelvis. This has innumerous advantages because as you all know the release of the deep nodule onto the uterosacral side is still remaining and we don't want the ovary to keep falling on us otherwise we would have to use the assistant grasper all the time just to lift us this ovary rather than give us a good counter traction. So the same needle is being used below my left lower port against the left lateral abdominal wall and this is temporarily hitched here. You can also use a 2-0 ethylon and do and pass the suture from outward to inwards and hitch it anteriorly. So this is just a temporary hitch and you will see how much exposure it has created. Now shifting attention to the other side. We have the task again to follow. The same task we have to release the bowel line there, locate the infundibulopelvic ligament, locate the right ureter before we start doing anything else. Notice the bowel zeros are there on very very close proximity to the peritoneum. The scissor is a very very good instrument to lyse these flimsy adhesions and also when the serosa is very very close. The traction from the assistant side is also very important and the assistant should always be mindful of advancing the traction at all times so as to provide the best forces at the point of dissection. Surgery for deep endometriosis is basically a team effort and the camera person, the right sided assistant all play a very very important part. So that was the central bowel that was really stuck. So before releasing that central bowel, we decide to develop both the pararectal spaces proximally so as to be able to release the central part more confidently. As you will notice, the nose of the scissor is now turned with the concavity facing downwards and a slight preference onto the hard tissue while cutting is given. Very small and gentle persuasive forces, blunt forces are applied so as to tease the bowel downwards. You can also see that the serosa here is very snug. Notice the assistant grasper was applying traction onto the uterine part in an upward and outward direction. And this central bowel looks very very adherent indeed. So the white line again following the white line trying to develop the right medial pararectal converging on to the rectovaginal space there. Notice the movement of the scissors, the clear opening of the planes that follow. Fat is our guide there and the loose areolar tissue is also a guide that we are following the right plane. Now for this central adhesiolysis, a small amount of vasopressin is injected centrally and a slight preference onto the uterine side is given while cutting. Once the bulk of this tissue falls down, we again follow the pararectal plane to be able to finally reach into the area of the rectovaginal space and the rectovaginal septum. Notice the vertical movements of the scissor. So the scissor is not moving inward towards the bowel, it moves vertically.
the central part is being lysed now and you can already see the clear plane that is already seen at that level. Notice the play of the instruments, the use of both hands, the small movements that are made at each point of time. Also please notice the close camera work and the counter traction given by the right sided assistant port. All this is extremely important when performing a good job near vital structures. So finally we see the last part of the rectovaginal space dissection. See how easily the rectum is then dropped down. The nice areolar plane is finally achieved. So basically the protocol for surgery in a conservative surgery for endometriosis is to first normalize the anatomy, open all the pelvic spaces, the pararectals, the rectovaginal, if needed the paravesicles also. Once this much is done, then we, I, and safeguard the ureter of course, and once this, one, this much is done, then we identify the deep disease or the deep endometriotic nodular disease which is finally excised. So entering the proper rectovaginal space at this point of time that was the doubling of the recto, uh, rectum which was now dropped down. So you can see the S shaped doubling with this final release the, the doubled part drops down and the real rectovaginal space will now be opened. That's the, was the rectum. That's the rectovaginal space finally. Again starting the story on the right side, the same steps, the same principles, localization of the ureter, the infundibulopelvic ligament form a major part of the first adnexal normalization and release. So in this case the ureter is located just below the IP again. Another rule or major rule of surgery for endometriosis is to always start well in the normal plane or the normal area. So if you jump deep into the disease and try to release planes it's going to be difficult. You should always start at a place which looks healthy. So as you saw on the right side, we opened the peritoneum way away from the involved part. Following the ureter, gentle strokes are made. The tissue on top is cut so as to be able to follow it more closely. The idea at this level which is near the uterosacral level is to lateralize the ureter so as to be able to take the uterosacral nodule there in case present. See how the ureter is gently tucked down, the tissue on top is excised. Once the ureter is safely lateralized then the central disease or the central nodule at the level of the torus can be taken. So this is the final safeguarding of the ureter. You can see that, the, that my left hand was tugging on the uterosacral complex.
the uterus which was very very rigid and not antivertebral at all now looks fairly manipulable so this is around 8 cm to mass which was reported on the ultrasound and although this was reported as a chocolate cyst however this was a large hydrosalpinx and it was decided that since the left tube looked fairly okay we would go ahead with removal of this side tube one of the main difficulties when when removing the tube in such large tio masses wherein the tubal anat anatomy cannot be distinguished from the ovarian anatomy is to cut into the substance of the tube once this is done the muscularis of the tube unfolds itself and then it is fairly easy to follow the tubal line so if you can realize that the hydrosalpinx of the right tube was folding on to the ovarian side and it formed something like a tubo ovarian collection so this is the release of the tube that we are performing we will save this ovary when performing this step of salpingectomy it is very very important to keep an eye on the right sided ip ligament and inadvertent damage sometimes is possible that's why it's a good idea to keep your cuts towards or in preference towards the tubal side so that is something like an encysted collection between the tube and the right ovary there sometimes it's a good idea to move and start salpingectomy from the proximal end if the proximal end is more locatable or identifiable however in this case it was like a huge mass and so we proceeded from the distal end itself you can see the round ligament ahead of this area and now shifting attention to the proximal end of the tube and then proceeding now from proximal to distal side once this tube is removed we will then focus attention on to the right ovary that is the last part that is now being excised you can already see the ovarian surface now peeping from there once the tube part is removed trying to normalize the anatomy there following this ovarian surface to the ip ligament now that's the final bit of the tube which was removed a few tags here and there will be shortened and trimmed when the limits of tube versus ovary 
are not demarkable. This is the best way to do it in order to avoid inadvertent ovarian damage or damage to the IP ligament. So you can see I finally found the cleavage plane between the tube and the ovary now. Sometimes when dealing with severe PID also the tubo ovarian mass in a PID, it may be very very difficult to distinguish between the tubo ovarian borders. Then this strategy of cutting into the tube and then finally delineating it works better. As you can see now, the entire ovarian superior aspect is under vision. We have the right IP which is guarded and well into control and the remnant masses or the remnant part of the tubal tissue is finally being excised. This line is sometimes vascular and it is wise to use a good coagulation there to avoid a messy bleeding. So finally that is the last part or the fimbrial end of the tube probably and we have a good ovary with the tube completely removed. This is the adhesiolysis around the utero ovarian ligament releasing the undersurface of the right ovary finally and therefore normalizing the anatomy of the right ovary that is once the ovary is released from the undersurface and is anchored on two points by the utero ovarian on the proximal aspect and the infundibulopelvic on the distal aspect. You can already see the ureter deep down there. So there is no worry once this much amount of ureterolysis has been done. We will deal with the cyst on this side now. The same principles follow opening up of the cyst and then excision of the cyst wall. You can see the deep endometriosis which follows the IP ligament and the utero-ovarian ligament on the edge of the ovary. This is now being excised. You can see the deep endometriosis hugging just below on the uterine aspect there which was finally excised. That's the uterine side of the disease and while doing so, while making the cut, a small fibroid or a myoma was located which was also removed at the same time. You can see the myoma slipping out just below the ovarian ligament on the right side. The external aspect is as expected covered by deep infiltrating endometriotic tissue. So this is the release of the deep endometriotic tissue which overlies the posterior aspect of the isthmus and the cervical region or also known as the torus isthmicus. All this tissue caused fixed retroversion of the uterus. This is being identified and removed systematically now. We will not show the excision of the right chocolate cyst wall as basically the same principles follow. 
so now nearing the end of surgery you can see the clearance which is achieved from an unidentifiable pelvis to structures which are all opened up and in anatomical position a thorough wash is given you can see that all the planes are supple almost all the deep endometriotic tissue has been released from the posterior uterine aspect and the uterosacrals and we place a surgical barrier at the end the ovaries are well released and in position where they should be releasing the hitch on the ovary finally so this patient basically did very well in the post operative period this is her third post operative month we have put her on combined oral contraceptive pills on a long term therapy that is giving three packets at one go and then getting a period she will opt for a pregnancy in a couple of months she received her first period after the first withdrawal recently and it was painless her dyspareunia scores are also back to normal thank you